Do you want me to run upstairs to my other computer and see if it'll work for my other computer? No, nope. no, I got it. I got it now. Just need, I just need, De De Dean's there. Okay, great. No, wait, Nancy's there. Not Dean. I am? No, you're not there yet. All right, how about now? I'm not here. Yes, you're there. All right. No, oh, no, I'm talking uh, to my phone. Okay, so close the rendezvous window now. Ouch. We live. Hey, we're here. I'm trying to close out of the other one, and it's not going away. Uh, I'll just do this. That'll teach it. Okay. Okay, we're getting very... We're getting some screens through YouTube, some pictures through YouTube, so. Good. <laughs> we shouldn't be live on YouTube yet. We are. We are. I'm okay. seeing it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Good. Just don't put me on screen. <laughs> uh, well, you are. Oops. Yeah, so. Um, you can you. leave You can leave the Zoom window. <laughs> okay, bye. Thank Thanks, Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Take my headphones off. Yay. All right. Uh, now, why? Okay, you need to not control my camera. Okay. And then I'm going to make you all in a gallery. You're pretty like, quiet. I am? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, let's. it's not crazy quiet. It's manageable. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, true. <laughs> and oh, only solved so many problems tonight. Yeah, totally. All right. Let me see. You right. want to make I'm it so we can all share how much my backdrop I'm actually not gonna, feels like my life. I'm not going to go to the share side. All right. Okay. So there's Let's the not worry speaker about side. And there's Nick. And so now, Morgan, can you talk? Yep, I'm here. Perfect. I'm talking. Yep. Carolyn, can you talk? <laughs> yes, I can talk can't shut me up perfect and dean <laughs> we don't have dean oh we just dropped him oh we just dropped him why would we he was him? having difficulty connecting it seemed like yeah and we don't have your video fraser and you won't get it <sighs> okay so you're just gonna have to listen to me and assume that i'm there oh we could do that too okay that's cool. And I'll let Dean in. We don't get to see you? Nope. Nope. You're going to have to just listen Wait, to me. Wait, why but... did everyone else switch to blurred backgrounds? <laughs> it was a conspiracy. Can you, can you hear us now, Dean? Yes, I can hear you. Can okay. You hear me? Yes, yes. We are on the precipice here. We are, this we is really crazy. Are. Yeah, yeah. This is... Um, there we go. All right. Here, is that a better background for me? Uh... Sure, why not? Uh, it's a picture of what's in back of me, but it, you, know, you you are better. sitting in front Ooh. of a picture of your actual background. <laughs> yeah, it's because it's a close up of my of my bookshelves. Otherwise, if you look below, you're going to see stuff. That, see stuff. that reminds me of that uh, Mitchell and Webb. You know, fake the moon landing on the moon. What sure. do people find out? Uh, hey, I take my directions from Stanley Kubrick. All right. Okay, so, uh, hey everyone, Fraser here. So we are doing this because the traditional streaming system just, just crashed hard Bad things in happened. so many different ways. And so this is the backup. Dust. We are counting on Elon Musk to carry us through the Weekly Space Hangout. Like angel wings. Elon, don't let us down. All right, let me uh, let me start this show and see. There's two of me now, but anyway, let's get started. Let me find my intro. Hello and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, September seventh, the season premiere. I'm Fraser Kane, the publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about how science fiction inspired astronomers. What's being done to protect astronauts from radiation? Has SLS launched? No. 
uh, more, less radiogenic heat than we thought in the solar system, perseverance producing oxygen on Mars, and a new understanding of the floor of Jezero Crater. It is just going to be a action-packed news night. Joining me, fresh from their hiatus, we've got Dr. Morgan Rembert. Hey, Morgan. Hey, Fraser. Can we still say happy podcast day? Yeah, yeah. I believe it's mandatory. It's, it's so so good to be back. Yeah, welcome back. We've got uh, Nick Castle. Hey, Nick. Hey, he got the doctor. Oh, I did it. Dr. Nicholas Castle. Apologies, Dr. Castle. Thank you. Yeah. How's it, sounds, it going? It sounds pretty great, too, Dr. Castle. It sort of does. Just don't call me Dr. Nick. That's got other... I'm Dr. Nick. Yeah. Hi, Dr. <laughs> Nick. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> How was your summer? It was good. Yeah. Chaotic. I'm now in Florida. I don't understand how that happened. I believe that's how it works for everybody who ends up in Florida. They don't Sounds know. about right. That's how you become Florida man. <laughs> and we've got <laughs> honorary doctorate, Carolyn Collins-Peterson. Hey, Carolyn. That's Lady Carolyn to you? Lady Carolyn. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> your Highness. Yes, yes. Um, excellent. And how's your summer been going? Interestingly, yes. Has it hot. Has it been on fire? Here? Oh my yeah. god, yes. It was a hundred yesterday in Boulder. Yeah. Yeah. It's been it's yeah. been hot and dry. With the forest fires haven't shown up yet, but they're but I think they're coming Shh. for us. Yeah. We yeah. don't we do not speak of those. All right. Now, before we get into this week's special guest, we are going to uh, give a huge shout out to our good friends and fans at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. They really kept each other company through the long, dark summer of hiatus. And you should join this incredible community. Go to wshcrew.space and you can become a member of this elite team of executive producers. All right, let's get into this week's special guest and you can just see him from nose up right now. Uh, there you go. <laughs> We've got uh, Dean Regas. Hey, Dean, welcome back. Hello, hi everybody. Thank you so much for being patient with us as we worked our way through these technical issues today. No, I think it's the government trying to not let me tell you the truth about Pluto. I think it's something mm -hmm. has happened here. It's very suspicious, I assume. Uh, well, it's either it, Alan Stern or Neil deGrasse Tyson. One or the other has influenced this conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can't wait to get into it here. Now that we're live, I think this is great. So who are you? What do you do? Well, uh, my name is Dean Regas. I'm an astronomer from the works at the Cincinnati Observatory in Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, my main job is to publicize and popularize astronomy as a subject. And so uh, tonight, actually, we have this beautiful, gorgeous night tonight at the Cincinnati Observatory. We're going to be showing people uh, Saturn and the moon and Jupiter through some telescopes and get pretty uh, get some people pretty excited about it because we've had some cloudy weather around here. So this is our makeup night. Uh, but uh, most recently, oh, I've been uh, an author of several books. Uh, including Facts from Space, 100 Things to See in the Night Sky. And then my latest book is How to Teach Grownups About Pluto. <laughs> and I am uh, really excited to talk about that and, uh, and more as we, uh, we chat here tonight. So what is the short version of how to speak, how to teach? Why did you feel the need to teach adults about Pluto? Well, I, I, this is one thing that I've been noticing in my teaching is that uh, when I talk to groups of uh, kids, there's always like a kid that comes up to, uh, to me at the end of the talk to astronomy. He's like, he wants to tell me everything that she learned about the, the universe or planets or stars and that kind of thing. And then there's an adult that comes up and sidles up like we're having this conversation, me and this young person, and this adult bursts in with, well, back in my day, Pluto was a planet. And Pluto should still be a planet. And I'm like, I'm talking to this kid here about something else. You burst in talking about something that's not have anything to do with anything. And I thought, I'm getting a little tired of this. And I'm really sorry for those kids that are like super into this. And there's one thing and only one thing that grownups know about. Pluto should be a planet. Right. So I wanted to make this guide for the kids to kind of walk through the stages of, well, I even have the five stages of grief that the uh, adults go through. So I don't know if there's a kid's book out there that has the five stages of grief uh, illustrated. Right. But um, we want to have this uh, this conversation because I think the best way to teach grownups that 
times they are a changing and science moves on and we learn new stuff. I think it's from kids. And if uh, kids can read this book and then uh, help guide their parents through this, at least from the anger stage and maybe towards the acceptance stage, that would be great. So take us through the stages then. Well, and, and this was like, it was perfect because when the book came out, I, I, I posted on Facebook and social media. I said, you know, I have this new book out about Pluto and uh, how Pluto is not a planet and that, you know, all this stuff. And the comments were perfect. They ran the exact gamut. There was no way Pluto's still a planet. I was like, all right, there's anger. Got that. Uh, I was like, uh, you know, like, I don't know. They really made a mistake on this. So we got denial. Uh, yeah. Then we got, uh, well, you know, maybe they should keep Pluto a planet and some other things. There's your bargaining. Uh, and then, of course, I had the sad puppy dog eyes, depression comments. Uh, but then a fair number of, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Pluto's not a planet. There's a lot of acceptance. So I, it was great. In this one post, I had all five stages of grief <laughs> from these commenters. It was perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. I've seen the exact same thing. Um, and it, it is surprising to me how angry some people will get. I mean, they really need to move on through yeah. this, through these stages. And, and so with the book, I wanted to be like super supportive of the, the grownups too. And I, you know, I'm going from the, this book with the, the approach that, um, okay, first off kids that are reading this, you know, way more about astronomy than your grownups. We already know that that's done set. So we already know you're more of an expert than they are, but they still have this emotional connection. And it's like, it's like the one thing from astronomy that they remember. So you want to like encourage them to learn more, not to like shame them and not to be like, Oh, come on, old people. It's to encourage them. And <laughs> I, I thought of this line, which is it, it it, 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 it's funny to me because I, I'm so immersed in astronomy. Like this is my entire life. This is all I do is I think about astronomy. And there are a lot of kids that are in that kind of field, like they're in their star phase and that's all they can think about. So I put this line in there, which I thought ended up being really good is, is to the kids. I was like, kids, I know this is hard to understand, but your grownups do non-astronomy things. <laughs> Like they, they go out in the world and they do yeah. other things that don't have to do with astronomy. I know it's like hard to imagine what that is. And I don't know what people do when they go to do jobs that aren't astronomy related, by the way. I've, I've never figured out what people do when they go in the working world. Um, and so you have to understand, like they have had other things that have happened in their lives. And so you need to be understanding with them also. <laughs> but then after we get the sympathy, then we start turning into the hard science. We get a little bit of the history behind Pluto. Um, how Pluto is not the first planet to be demoted out of the planet club. Um, and uh, so we, we uh, set up some precedents and all sorts of other things that adults and grown up terms that, uh, you know, they always like. It's kind of, I guess, like an adult coming up and talking to you about a, what is it, a brontosaur? Like yeah, a dinosaur yeah. that doesn't exist. Exactly. Never existed, exactly. But we were taught. I'm still I'm traumatized by that because I'm yeah. just like, yeah, Brontosaurus, and that's all. That's the one. I, that's the one I know. Like, except yeah. for the the one with the stubby yeah. arms. Other than that, I you know I don't know any other dinosaur. Yeah, we were watching the the Attenborough dinosaurs show on Apple TV Plus or whatever, and I didn't know the name of any of the dinosaurs on it except for the Tyrannosaur. It's like everything else, it's just gibberish dinosaur. I'm like. I can't believe I don't know the names of all these dinosaurs. Young me would be furious. And I think oh, yeah. it's the same thing with for a lot of people. Like they just haven't kept track of it. So then what do you think needs to be done with Pluto? Well, so that's a tough one because it's not like this is a nice, easy, put everything in nice little neat categories. Um, and so I kind of run through how complicated it is and how difficult it was for people in the past, how when they, when astronomers discovered asteroids that threw everybody off because they're like, well, they're planets, but then they decided, no, they're not planets. And because they share a common thing, they, they share an orbit. There's no one dominant force in the, in the solar system, in, the, in that part of the solar system. So it, it goes to this, uh, this idea that, you know, dominance is the main thing that makes a planet, not roundness, not, uh, you know, it, it's the main thing in that, uh, that uh, area. And so asteroids are not planets because they share this common origin and common area. There's no dominant force. 
Uh, of course, Jupiter, you could claim is the dominant force in the asteroid belt, just like with Pluto and the Pluto belt or Plutoids that I like to call them and the Kuiper belt. Uh, Neptune is the, the mover and shaker and the other things are just falling in line. And so um, what is Pluto? I like the breakdown of, you know, you have your inner planets, asteroid belt, outer planets, Plutoids. That's what I like to call them as Plutoids. Um, just, they all share kind of a common, uh, common history, common origin and common makeup. So, uh, but of course this is, this is hard to, to put into nice, neat little things because then you have objects like Sedna. So I throw Sedna into the book as a little extra thing. And, and, uh, we, you know, so if the adults, uh, the grownups are really sad about Pluto because Pluto was the oddball, the, uh, the eccentric one, the, the, the one that, you know, didn't fit in. Actually, Pluto's in part of a population of other objects that are very similar to it. Now, Sedna is the strange thing, about two thirds the size of Pluto, reddest object in the solar system, has an orbit that takes it around 10,000, five years, 500 years ago around the sun once. So I pitch that if uh, their grownups really miss Pluto, they will love Sedna. Right. And we gotta, we're going to get T-shirts made that say Sedna is the new Pluto. That's what I think we should do. Well, Eris is the one that I use as, as the challenge. I'm like, what do you, what should, if you think Pluto should be a planet again, what should we do with Eris? It's roughly the size of Pluto. It's in the same region. It has a moon. Is it, Absolutely a, does it right. get to be a planet? Like we're never going back to nine planets. Like we no, may have no. 10 or a hundred, but we're never going to have nine again. No, so, and you're absolutely right. Yeah, because Eris changed the whole ball game. And yeah. in fact, I, I, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson gets a lot of the attention for this Pluto debate and demoting Pluto at the Hayden Planetarium. Um, and, uh, you know, I put him in the book too, because I was like, you know, I was totally, by the way, I was super Pl Pluto defender back in 2001, two, three, something like that when Neil deGrasse Tyson comes on the scene. And I was like, who does this Neil deGrasse Tyson guy think he is? He can't just like kick Pluto out all by himself. We got, we have a process for this. Like we, you know, we, we meet, we talk. And I was like, well, wait, do we have a process? What, what is the process? I just assume we do have one. I don't know yeah. what it is, but he can't do that. I know that that's for sure. And so uh, there was this big outrage to Neil deGrasse Tyson. And I even put this in the book. There was a, I was in this uh, planetarium news group way back then. Uh, that's how old this was, this is the news group days. And one of the planetarium operators, um, he was very mad and he said, well, if Neil deGrasse Tyson can unilaterally demote Pluto, then I am reclassifying the Hayden Planetarium where he works as a movie theater. Right. <laughs> Ooh, now I know to the average person, that's not a big slam, but in the planetarium community, you just like dissed um, bad. I mean, that is- I think I can guess who that was. <laughs> you know, I, I forget who it was, but I'm, I would love to credit whoever that was that said yeah. that because yeah. that was awesome. And it's in the book. And, uh, but I would say that he actually bears responsibility than Mike Brown, the astronomer from Caltech who discovered Eris and Maki Maki, Haumea, the other objects that are out there in the Kuiper belt. Uh, he was the one that really kind of changed the game because I went through this whole process. I was like, no way Pluto's still planet. And then I thought about it I was like, okay, well, there's no reason to kick it out until we find something bigger. And I said this out loud to our other, my, my other astronomer here, Paul Knorr, we, we were talking about Pluto and I was like, okay, how about when we find something bigger than Pluto, then we'll talk. That very next week was the announcement about Eris from Mike Brown and right. Eris is slightly bigger than Pluto. And, and I was like, oh, well, all right. Time I to talk. Gotta... <laughs> have that talk. <laughs> Yeah. Time to have that talk. And so then it was like, okay, 10 planets. Great. Eris is a planet. And uh, Mike Brown, you know, this is uh, meeting him was a big moment in my life and changing how I think about Pluto, because here's a guy that could be the discoverer of multiple planets, Eris, Haumea, Maki, Maki, Sedna, all could be planets. And he 
no. He's like, no, I did not discover a planet. Yes. Absolutely not. He gave up yeah. the fame and fortune of a planet discover. And I'm like, what are you doing, Mike? Don't you, you have it all. You are, could be the discoverer. Of That's worlds. a really good point. <laughs> yeah. He could have been the guy who discovered the 10th, 11th, 12th planets but instead he threw it all away yeah, he just, much he just, to his family's dismay too that his fam he told me like his family is still mad at him about this that he threw away this uh, fame and fortune but now he can walk around freely while neil degrasse tyson be hassled everywhere but i think that it's it's amazing that you know he he gave me the, the best definition of planet and he he said you know let's not worry about these you know the iau international astronomical union definitions a planet is a big important thing in the solar system a uniquely big and important thing in the solar system so you there's eight of those there's our sun and then there's eight uniquely big important things that are secondary and that's all you really have to go with mm -hmm. is, is is that when you get into nitpicking about pluto Eris, Ceres, all these other things they are minor yeah. bodies in comparison to the eight and each one of these worlds is fascinating on their own and worth attention and exploration and enjoyment. And yeah, whether or not most, it's a planet or not a planet, it's categorization doesn't matter. Most definitely. And a really important part about my book that I wanted to do, and I'll of course give it a big plug because I want to put it right if you're on the screen, is um, I wanted to make Pluto happy. Because in almost all other books talking about Pluto and the Pluto debate, he is sad, depressed, Poor you know, Pluto. oh, I'm kicked out of the planet club. No, he is actually happy. Look at him. Look at him. He's pretty good. Uh, by the way, one other thing you'll notice about the book is the illustrations. I got to help out, uh, kind of give advice on the illustrations. And we made one teeny tiny little adjustment that I, I suggested. And is that all the, the, the planets that are depicted have noses. Non-planets have no nose. Oh. If you notice that in the thing. But anyway, I wanted yeah. to make sure that Pluto was happy in the book because he's with his Fantastic. friends and relatives out there. Um, and, and frankly, he doesn't care. But if he did care, then uh, you know, at least he's with his, his, his friends and, and colleagues. And, and it also celebrates the discoveries that were made out of Pluto because you don't want to forget about all that. The New Horizons yeah. spacecraft that went out there. Um, but there's so much else out there that's been discovered too. And so it's great to talk about Pluto and this debate. I think it opens a lot of doors and opens a lot of people's ideas to it. Um, and now it can be like the entryway to what else is out there too. Awesome. Well, Dean, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I know you've got a busy event planned for tonight. So clear skies. And, uh, and good luck with everything you're working on. It's great to talk to you again. Thank you so much. Oh, th thanks for having me here. Glad to kick off the season with y'all and uh, good to see everybody. And uh, hopefully we'll talk again soon. I'm sure we will. And your next book, you seem to write a lot of them. Oh man, it's, just, it's so fun. I'm, you know, like I'm so tickled about this book cause I've been wanting to do this for a while. And so uh, hopefully everybody enjoys it too, kids and adults. Cause I definitely snuck in some adult uh, awesome. themes and humors too that, you know, the kids won't get probably but anyway i think all right. adults do fantastic all right take care good luck and uh, thank clear you skies. thanks dean keep looking up all right let's move on to the news portion of the evening um all right let's talk about the big elephant in the room morgan let's talk about sls it's still on the launch pad what yeah i'm I know. surprised just, i'm shocked you, you could not have predicted that another season would come and go and SLS would still be waiting, uh, waiting to lift off. But we've gotten closer than we've been before with launching SLS. And it seems like as we get closer, the more we realize sort of what we're trying to do. Um, so over the last week, I think most viewers have probably seen NASA's tried to launch SLS twice and had to scrub both of them. The first one actually during the countdown and the second one really before the countdown had even begun. And both of these uh, scrubs had to do with the sort of loading of the fuel into the rocket. And like the space shuttle before it, um, SLS uses a hydrogen based fuel uh, as one of its main components of, of the fuel mixture. And that's not an accident because SLS is actually just literally using the space shuttle engines. 
uh, for their uh, main engines. And that was a requirement of Congress when they authorized the, the rocket. And hydrogen is just hard to work with. Yeah. You know, it's the second coldest element in the universe, uh, only behind helium. And it's the smallest element in the universe. And so getting liquid, he- getting liquid hydrogen to do what you want is, is not easy. And in fact, going all the way back to some of the pre-launch fueling tests over the summer, uh, NASA has tried six times now to fuel SLS, either intending to launch it or just testing the fueling system. And in none of those six times have they been successfully able to load all of the propellant onto the rocket. Uh, In fact, this last week, they didn't even get to like a quarter full before they started seeing that the hydrogen was leaking out along the seam of a hose that's designed to to load the hydrogen in. And this is not a surprise if you are somebody who grew up uh, with the space shuttle, Mm -hmm. because space shuttle launches scrubbed like all the time. I think if you total up all of the launch attempts over the history of the space shuttle, on average, it's scrubbed at least once per mission. I and went a all lot the way of those to Florida to see a hydrogen. scrubbed launch. I went all the way yeah. to Florida, waited a week. It was scrubbed, I think, three times during that week, and then they scrubbed it for a month. And so I had to fly home not having watched a space shuttle launch. Yeah, and NASA is kind of alone now in using hydrogen as a primary fuel. Um, you know, Starship ha- has moved to using uh, methane as its main fuel source. I think Falcon 9 uses like a kerosene yeah, derivative kerosene. effectively. Yeah. Um, and those fuels are not quite as energy dense when you think about them from the liquefied perspective, but they're dramatically just vastly more easy to work with. Yeah. And when you're looking towards a future where hopefully you're going to be launching rockets pretty frequently, the ability just to get the thing on the launch pad and into orbit is sort of more important, as SpaceX has demonstrated, than having like the most exquisitely perfect um, specific impulse or something like that, which is what you get from a hydrogen-based engine. And, and so we're kind of stuck now. Uh, NASA is trying to fix a couple of the issues on the launch pad right now. Uh, and they won't have another chance to launch until um, the second half of, of September. But already we're kind of seeing the trouble here because their launch abort system, which is basically like a block of TNT strapped to the side of the rocket that's designed to blow it up if it goes off course, it works on a battery-based system. And those batteries are only certified for a certain amount of time. It's about three weeks. And just to launch this past week or to attempt to launch this past week, NASA needed an exception from the Space Force who manages the Kennedy range because those batteries were already past their expiration date effectively. Now, if they want to launch again in two more weeks, they're going to have to ask for a second extension, basically doubling what's the sort of theoretically optimal range for these batteries. And, And if Space Force denies that, which they might very well do, or NASA decides not to ask for that second extension, they would have to roll the entire rocket back to the VAB in order to swap out the battery effectively. And and these things just add up. Uh, And this is what you're looking at when you're trying to say, okay, well, SLS is gonna launch the Artemis mission. And for that to work, you know, we got to pre-stage these various pieces and we've got to get the astronauts on en route at the right time to meet up with the Lunar Gateway and this and that. And when it becomes difficult to keep the schedule, all of that just becomes more complicated. Yeah. And, and so we'll see, I think SLS will fly and I have every confidence that when it flies, it will work well. But every little bit of delay here is one step farther down the line for one of these alternatives, whether it's New Glenn, whether it's Starship, et cetera, to prove itself as a a functional, reliable rocket and sort of take that role before SLS sort of literally or figuratively can get off the ground. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at this point with the scrubs that we've had, and it's almost certain, like I think they're holding out hope that they might be able to launch They've got like one more window open, but but there's no way they're going to chase down all these problems. What happens next? Yeah, so then they have to roll it back 
into the uh, into the vehicle assembly vehicle and or building and sort of recycle it, which means you know doing all of these little steps to get going. I think there's another possible launch window in the second half of October. Uh, but because the trajectory that this particular mission to go around the moon has to take, the launch windows is not like every day. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you get one or two looks a month, basically, where, where you can do this. And each time you have to wheel this, you know, enormous thing back into the uh, storage and take out all the batteries and disarm all the explosives and this and that, and and then yeah. store all the fuel and, and all of that. And... I mean, we knew all these problems existed because the space shuttle had all of these problems and it was a worthwhile trade-off in part because the technology at the time, that was what you had, but also because the space shuttle was designed to be reusable and it was this big hulking thing that had to go all the way up to orbit and back down every time. So you needed that sort of exquisite efficiency that the space shuttle main engines gave you. Um, and so sort of in aggregate, if you thought the space shuttle was a good idea, using hydrogen was the way to accomplish it. But now, you know, literally 50 years, basically after the design phase for the space shuttle engines, um, it's a different equation. Mm -hmm. And we're throwing those engines away every time we launch a an SLS rocket now. But we're also kind of too far, you know, we're tens of billions of dollars uh, down this path now. There's There's no turning around. You know, you have to advance this thing till it works and then evaluate it on its operational merits against what happens to be there, whether it's right. new, new Glenn and, or. And, and right now there's nothing like like I think it's really important that right now there is nothing. to. Right. There's no guarantee that Starship will work. Yeah, that's the thing. We and all new think Glenn, based on the last decade that it might. And new Glenn is no a mystery in a box. In space you you we know that crew dragon works but you can't put a crew dragon on a falcon heavy like there just there is no heavy lift crew spacecraft rocket out there today right and you know and it it sucks basically yeah. that we're stuck here like if you, if nasa throw away sls just like they threw away constellation we're talking about moon landings in the 2040s yeah. And and so we're kind of at this point, the decisions were made, you know, a decade ago or more uh, to go on this evolved space shuttle path. That's that's the way forward until something else proves itself. Right. And so we're we're all kind of stuck on this sort of lumbering giant right now. Hopeful. I think nobody wants SLS to fail and just waiting. You know, it's supposed to launch in 2017, supposed to launch in 2018, supposed to launch in 2019, so on and so on. And now to be so close and to yet not be able to get these basic steps like getting fuel into the rocket to work without issue is is frustrating. And I think NASA feels it probably as much or more than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's the law. They have to do this. Yeah, there's no, there is no working around it at this point. Yep, yep, totally. All right. Thanks, Morgan. All right, Nick, let's talk about oxygen on Mars. There's a tree on yeah. Mars, and it's made of metal <laughs> and plutonium. Not so much made out of plutonium, although it is a little bit powered by that. Um, this is essentially an artificial tree. Um, I mean, I would phrase it a little bit differently. It's a pump with a electrolysis system to take the atmosphere and strip it from carbon to try to make oxygen. The whole idea uh, that NASA's kind of changed their mentality for thinking about how might we send humans to Mars uh, is this idea of live off the land. What resources does Mars present that would make this easier? And one of the big things that people have come back to again and again and again is, well, it's not much of an atmosphere and it's a toxic gas, carbon dioxide, but it's an atmosphere. Why don't we use it? So the thought is, if we can electrolyze the atmosphere, that is, if we can use electricity to split the carbon and the hydrogen, uh, or, sorry, carbon and oxygen apart from each other, then we can keep the oxygen. Yeah. And that's great for breathing. Um, and so this instrument uh, on the Perseverance rover is the first real test case for that. The concept is really easy, but doing it is hard. And I just ran across a completely fantastic paper from a couple weeks ago uh, in Science Advances that talks through what is it that the MOXIE instrument has been doing? They've run it something like nine times now. And it's not just a, you know, we ran this, it worked. We <laughs> ran it again. Hey, it still works. 
what they're actually looking at is the atmospheric pressure on Mars is highly variable yeah. as a function of temperature and as a function of season. And there's a great figure in this paper that I wish we could show you, but you know, technology goes blank. And what it's showing is it looks like this big gray band that goes up and down. But what it is, is it's actually the uh, day and night cycle of temperatures rising and falling. And then superimposed mm. on that is a bigger scale wave for what happens in the seasons. And one of the really cool parts, so the hotter the air is, the more volume it takes up. So that effectively lowers the pressure that you're dealing with. So you'd actually want to run this instrument during the night where the temperature is colder. And so it's a little bit denser. And so it's easier to pull that atmosphere into the instrument and run it through electrolysis. But if you also think about like, when's the exact best time in the seasons, the high point is in late fall. It's not the dead of winter. And the reason why is because winter got too cold and we started forming the polar cap. The air literally started condensing on the ground and forming a solid. So there's less of it. Hmm. That so, to me was one of those like, wait, we've known this for years, but I never would have thought of that. So That's astronauts so cool. really are going to only want, they're going to learn to want to be able to breathe at night and in the fall. Yes, pretty much. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's about how do we dial in this instrument? How do we make it work right? But there's a yeah. lot of just really cool nuance to that. It's the kind of thing that until you try to do it, you may not have thought of. These are all the complexities you deal with. Well, but it really and reveals so they're running this different idea tests. Of, of like people wanting to live on Mars. And, mm -hmm. and there is a laundry list of things that need to be figured out. And this is just one oh, yeah. perfect example of just making the air that you want to breathe is more complicated than anybody thought. And so they're going to have to develop a machine that is able to average out the air production to they can produce enough air at the worst season at the worst time of day, not at the best yep. season, the best time of day, or you're going to need a way to store it or whatever, right? It's just that it's more complicated yep. than anybody ever thought. And what a surprise. And every single and thing this is true for other systems. We everything. look at as well. Yeah. Like one of the reasons why Starship is based around a methane engine is because the thought is if we bring water to Mars, we can electrolyze the water to free up hydrogen, combine that with the carbon that we're pulling out of the atmosphere and make methane. So that's the rocket fuel to send it back. Well, this is the first step is can we electrolyze the atmosphere? The next one will be let's bring some water along with us uh, and then do both steps and make rocket fuel on the surface. But you got to actually do these things in place yeah. to figure out just how messy and complicated they are. Yeah, totally. 100%. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. All right. Uh, Carolyn, let's talk about astronomers being inspired by science fiction. What? Yeah. So that when I saw that headline, I just really had to go and go after that. Because when I was a kid, I was reading science fiction. And of course, I was inspired by Star Wars, Star Trek, because I wasn't a kid when that came out. But um, a lot of science fiction uses astronomy and planetary science as an element. So it's, it's not really a surprise that, you know, people that are interested in science would glom onto that. Um, a, a, a good example I could think of is just in Star Trek, if you've ever seen, like, they've divided the galaxy into quadrants. We have Alpha, Beta, Delta, Quadrant. It's likely that these things would, would attract future scientists. And in my case, I think I was reading Heinlein and, and watching the Apollo rockets go off. So those things inspired me in a lot of ways. I wanted to be an astronaut for the longest time. And, and again, I was inspired by Star Trek and kids science fiction. And I get to graduate school and it turns out, you know, there's a lot of us who are also into the same kind of science fiction um, and, and, and some other stuff too. I mean, I had an office mate that said, oh, you got to read Ursula Le Guin. Um, I took our Serenity, you know, favorite SF books. Um, same with Planetarium people actually. And you know, Dean brought those guys up. Um, and, and there have been attempts to assess like interest in the general public in science fiction, but there, nobody's really sat down and said, okay, how many astronomers are out there that were really, um, you know, inspired by science fiction to go to astronomy. And so being astronomers, um, you know, we can do surveys, we can gather data. And so what if somebody did a survey of astronomers to see who was influenced into their career by their interest in science fiction? So the story that kind of grabbed my attention was about a study that Dr. Elizabeth Stanway did at the Center for Exoplanets and Habitability at the University of Warwick in the UK. So these are all UK people. And she wanted to see who was influenced into their career. So she 
ask a group of a people at a meeting at her university um, how many you know were interested in science fiction. I think that was 35 or 40 people. And then she did a larger survey at a meeting called the UK National Astronomy Meeting, which was in July of this year. And what she found was, so this is about 300 people total that she surveyed, a significant minor, a majority of them expressed an interest in science fiction. So 93% of those UK astronomers, that's 223 out of 93%. And I guess, yeah, you know, it's, it's a good amount expressed yeah. an interest in science fiction. A fewer number of those, about 160 or so, stated that it had actually influenced them into a career into this. And so I thought that was kind of interesting. There's some st strong statistics among this group that kind of back the idea that astronomers were in, uh, influenced, at least a number of them were in, influenced into science fiction. Yeah. Yeah. I, again, no surprise to me. Yeah, it's not a surprise, like, but, you know, you want everyone to here. Were we yeah. all inspired by science fiction to some yeah. degree? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, which, you know, the, yeah. Yeah. I, it, you know, it's not a complete bunch. I mean, there are people who have no interest in it whatsoever, still got involved in science fiction. She actually grouped her respondents into these schematic groups of people. And one of them was, so she basically had the asymptotic branch of science fiction lovers. So she, she did kind of an HR diagram. And these were the people that kind of had the re really weird answers to her questions, but there was this amount of people, it was pretty big, called the Astronomer's Main Sequence. And they were the people who really loved science fiction and they cite its influence on them. I kind of got an interesting kick out of the, sci the SFH science fiction haters cooling track and the D-clump, which were people that didn't like science fiction, but were still influenced into it by some, into science by some aspect of science fiction. Right, that's funny. I think this could go like, this relationship could go either way too. I think yeah. there's a huge fraction of people who science fiction was an inspiration for them getting into astronomy. But I also think there's sort of the realm of astronomers who then sort of explore into science fiction because, you know, of all the sciences, astronomy is so much, you're so remote from the things that you're interested in or you're studying or you're working with. Mm -hmm. It's not like geologists or something where you get to, you can go out into the Utah desert Pick up and, a rock. you know, yeah. see, see the world of geology. And so I think there's an element of always having to imagine what it is that you're working on in, even if you're imagining it fully in the context of the real universe. And I think that leap then lends itself very well to taking that extra little bit. Okay. What if the universe is exactly what I thought but this one thing was different, mm -hmm. or this one step farther. Yeah, and and I think so that's I'm just kind of a cool, cool way to think for about a moment it. here. Uh, geology <laughs> requires quite a bit of imagination because you can't just go out to the Grand Canyon and see a million years of history. You have to imagine like what what happened here that we think this reflects a million years of history, or actually more than that for the Grand Canyon. So that's a good point. I, I will concede that point example. for sure. Yeah, I will certainly concede that point. But I think it is interesting that you don't see as much like, you know, earth history fiction. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I you think about you know, like, it's, yeah. there's definitely there a difference some interesting there. interesting sci-fi on that though. I mean, is get there? into the like, can you travel back to the dinosaurs or the mm -hmm. whole theory of Jurassic Park? Well, you got or, Jurassic Park here, you know? I mean, yeah. you've got a lot of the stuff that's yeah. been inspired from paleontology and, you know, that kind of yeah. what if if things had gone a little bit differently. So the interesting but thing, actually, uh, oh, I was gonna bring up the interesting thing that struck me as I was reading the paper and she does summarize this later in the paper is we don't have enough data and it would be really fun to examine exactly the attitude you guys are bringing up because mm. this was more or less, she had like four questions. I could see a hundred you know, questions being but asked. This is a AAA really, really survey really waiting to happen. Granular. Yeah, yeah, but to get really granular data about this, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to see that expanded to more than just straight up astronomers, because I'm a planetary scientist. And I got into, ironically, I got into science fiction because I got taught about science and thought it was mm -hmm. really cool. And then mm -hmm. I got into planetary science because I really, really enjoyed science fiction that I'd mm -hmm. been brought into by science. Well, you know, you realize that in some planetary science teams do use astronomy or I'm sorry, science fiction. Um, you can look at the surface of Charon, Charon, for example. There mm -hmm. are science fiction related names on that. I remember when the Pathfinder landed, there was, you know, that naming frenzy of all the rocks 
that you know the rock garden they went into and yeah some of them were you know rocky and boo-boo and all this kind of stuff but there were other names in there that were science fiction related and i first time i actually realized well these guys read science fiction same with uh you know with the the new horizons team they were flinging names you know all over the place there's spock and clark and everybody's on there you know it is funny there's, there's an influence yeah and it is funny that we've got all of those those names of the moons of Uranus, which are named after Shakespearean yeah. protagonists. And you've got the the various moons that are named after Roman and Greek gods and their offspring and so on. And it's really cool that there are all of these geological features on Pluto that are named after science fiction legends. And I hey, think Serenity Chasma and places. Yeah. 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 How great is that? I think it's wonderful that that did I do fiction. I have a minute to tell you about the, the other cool part she had in the paper? You have she, one minute she, and then we should definitely start okay. to wrap. She did up. a survey of all these different names that people apply to their software that they're using for analysis. Yes. So the, the four that I thought were really cool were Minbar, which is multi-instrument burst archive, <laughs> Borg from Star Trek, the brightest of reorganization epic galaxy survey, Tatooine Star Wars was used to describe circumbinary planets. And it stands for the attempt to observe outer planets in non-single stellar environments. And Akbar, my favorite, uh, the Arc <laughs> Minute, trap. the Ac- Arc Minute <laughs> Cosmology Bolometer Array Receiver. It's a trap. It's a photon trap. <laughs> That's awesome. I thought that was pretty cool. That is so great. All right. Well, you know what? I think we've we've we're running long in terms of time. I know we had a rough start in the beginning, but I think I'm going to to br- land this plane at this point. So let me just put everybody back on the screen um oh actually you know what carolyn you're on my screen right now so why don't you let people know where they can find out more and what you're working on oh i'm everywhere fraser i'm everywhere uh the spacewriter.com i'm on uh um twitter at, at spacewriter but you can find a lot of my writing now on universe today and i'm working on still working on that book so <laughs> Yeah, no. There you I, go. We, we talked about this before we went on hiatus, how much of an impact yeah. you're making on Universe Today, and the impact continues. So thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I love the stories that you pick because it's often the ones that a lot of the other writers will will dodge, and you go after them, the the really cool exoplanet stuff, the astronomy stuff, the, the observational. Science yeah, the science yeah. and the science fiction <laughs> survey stuff, which is a lot yeah. of fun. So yeah, no, it's great. Morgan, what are you working on? Where can people find out more? Oh, yeah. This summer, I've written some really cool uh, pieces for EOS, magazine for American Geophysical Union, including the other story I was going to talk about today about uh, this using uh, anti-neutrinos to peer inside the Earth to see Mm -hmm. how much radioisotopes there are out there cooking heat for us. So definitely go check that out. It's it's pretty crazy to think that you can... uh, do that and it's all enabled by the 2011 fukushima disaster so it's a neat uh wow. you wouldn't expect it that's it's really uh, cool. it's pretty neat awesome and if people want to follow your work yeah check me out on uh at morgan renberg on twitter or much more frequently uh at morgan renberg.com dr castle <laughs> oh i'm never gonna hear the end of that you never I? will no no no, no oh, i will so i will respectfully use your your full title the right honorable dr castle <laughs> no wait that's a canadian so, reference all right uh i'm the wandering scientist uh you can find me at wander um uh, both on instagram and on twitter although not very much either of them recently um i'm now uh working at florida state university on a new postdoc with wow. totally different projects and Hmm. that's fun and exciting and i can't share it you just did oops <laughs> <laughs> all right um of course i'm uh universe today on all the things uh, i'm starting to queue up all of the new interviews that i'm going to be doing a lot of really cool interviews coming up we've been doing lots of the new qa is finished we got more live streams next monday uh our weekly space bites segment all of the stories that are happening on universe today the newsletter it is a space fire hose you definitely want to check out if you haven't already um cool well let's put everybody back up on the screen here and I'm going to move me up into this little corner here so that I'm, and they, they didn't even see me. You know, the, the, the co-hosts didn't even see me this whole episode. They were just going by audio. Look at them. They're such pros. 
Uh, thank you everyone for watching us on YouTube today. Thanks to all the mods for helping out. Thanks to Nancy Graziano for organizing all of the cats again. If you are interested, I we just posted a fascinating interview with Nancy on my podcast feed. And so you can hear the history of the Weekly Space Hangout, how she does her work, what her plans are for the future of the Weekly Space Hangout. So definitely go and check that out. It's on the podcast feed and we're interviewing. Oh my gosh, I got to find out what her plans for us are. Yeah, yeah. They're haunting <laughs> and terrifying uh, and yet inspiring. Uh, and actually, there's an interview with Carolyn coming up as well. So you're going to be able to hear that as well. All right. So uh, thank you, everyone. And sorry to... For the rough start, thanks to our special guest, and thanks to Pamela and Annie for tr for heroic efforts to try and get this rocket off the ground this season. And unfortunately, we had to move to our backup. We will have it all sorted out next week. I I promise. All right.